At the end of this video, we'll take a look at Mad Ramp's innovative pivoting ramp system, the safer, easier way to transport your ATVs and snowmobiles. Stick around. Before we begin, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our friends at the historic Lancaster Motel in Lancaster, New Hampshire. The Lancaster Motel has been serving snowmobilers since the 60s and they are the perfect eastern trail riding destination for snowmobilers young and old. The Lancaster Motel is right on Corridor Trail 5 in Lancaster, New Hampshire with plenty of parking for vehicles, sleds and trailers. Plus, the Lancaster Motel is within walking distance of Crane's Snowmobile Museum plus restaurants, shopping, entertainment and more. Click the link in the description to learn more about the Lancaster Motel. Good evening and welcome to the podcast. I'm really glad you're here. We have a full slate of vintage snowmobile entertainment on tap for you tonight. But before we get to all that, I want to make sure that everything is working properly. So if you can see my face and hear my voice, I'm going to ask you to leave a comment in the comment section. Let me know where you're viewing this from, and also let me know uh, whether you're a first-time viewer or a regular viewer. Now, to our first-time viewers, I thank you for coming by to check us out. I hope you enjoy this and like what you see, and I also hope that you decide to join us here every week at 9 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday evening. Now, to our regular viewers, I thank you so much for coming by here every single week to check out the podcast. It really means a lot. It's one thing to do this. It's another thing for people to show up for it. And yet another thing still for people to show for it, show up for it each and every week. So I thank you guys so much for doing that. Let's get into the comments. Let's do a few comments and then we're going to bring on our first guest. Uh, let's see. We have Judy Pilsky saying good evening. Thank you, Judy, for checking in. Joshua Gilbert, regular viewer. Uh, he and Asa are tuned in tonight. We really appreciate that. And Joshua is out west. And I think Joshua knows our guest tonight. Uh, let's see, Rick Moore from uh, the past in Manitoba, Canada. Now, Judy Pilsky, uh, oh, Judy and Ju Judy, Doug and Jennifer uh, from Pilsky, Mosinee, Wisconsin. We have John Spranger Jr. from Elan, Wisconsin. Now, to John Spranger Jr. and all his friends and relatives who are on here tonight, we've got a video of his that we're going to be airing. It's not on the card that I showed earlier. Uh, I added his vid video a little later, so I didn't have time to put that on there, but he's going to be on tonight, and uh, you'll, you'll be uh, seeing the video that he made for us. Uh, Nick Kafez, loud and clear from Shelby Township, Michigan, regular viewer. Thank you so much for coming on here every week, Nick. We really appreciate it. And uh, Sandra Spranger from Eland, Wisconsin. One more before we get to um, 
our first guest, Tom Gregory from Armada, Michigan, and Brian Robillard, our good friend from Putnam, Connecticut. Now, without further ado, let me switch screens here, and we're going to bring on our first guest, Mike Mehar. Let me get the screens. There we go. Uh, and get your mic on. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing good tonight. Well, good, good. I'm really glad you're on. I know we've been talking about this for quite a while, and it's a genuine pleasure to see you here on the podcast tonight. Yeah, I really did want to get on earlier with you, too, and I just the winter was just so busy, and actually Thursday night is always a tough night for us. So. Sure, not a problem at all. And when you say you're busy, that is the understatement of the year. I'm going to give you just a taste of Mike's resume. He is a uh, he does the publication for the Vintage Snowmobile Club of America, which is a nice, glossy publication on heavy paper. If you like vintage snowmobiles, that is the magazine to subscribe to, and there's a link to it in the description. He also uh, is the organizer for Central Minnesota Pond Racing. He's been very busy with that all winter, as you can imagine, and then he also hosts some other events throughout the year, and we're going to ask him here to go into some detail. Uh, before, we do, um, before we talk about the magazine, Mike, I've got a quick graphic I'm, I'm going to uh, show. I, I couldn't help myself. It's only about 30 seconds long, but I'm going to put it up to set you up to talk about the magazine. Let's take a look. There it is. You know where I got that, right? <laughs> that, right, right. I like that one. It's good. Ooh, cool. Yeah, please tell us about the magazine. Um, I think, well, I do know quite a few people from coast to coast, but uh, actually my wife and I, my late wife, Judy, you know, bought the magazine in 2005. And it's just been a, a fun thing for our family, our whole family's involved. And we've met so many good people across the, the snow belt. Um, vintage snowmobiles are still probably the best group of people you're going to find anywhere in any sport. Um, Agreed, uh, absolutely. Magazine's still hanging in there, I think. I'm not sure, but I think right now I'm probably one of the longest owners of the magazine that kept it going, you know. So uh, Wonderful. that's kind of a thing on our bucket list that makes me feel good, you know. But um, Yeah, for sure. I know you work real hard on it. And it's a beautiful magazine. If anybody is viewing this, and he's, he's, he, he, yeah, my tongue is in a knot. And if you're even remotely curious about the magazine, there is a link in the description uh, where you can subscribe to the magazine. And this comes out how many times a year, Mike? Yeah, it's four times a year. It comes out in March, June, September, and December. And we cover pretty much anything to do with vintage snowmobiles, um, all the way from restorations, shows, of course, and uh, vintage racing. The last couple of years has been a pretty big, a pretty big deal across the Midwest, and it was doing pretty good in the East. You guys just had a tough winter with the COVID stuff yeah. this year, I heard. You know, so. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And this is a good opportunity. I'm going to pop a couple of covers on the screen so people can see the uh, the December issue is there on the left and the March issue, uh, which I imagine has just come out, is the, the uh, image there on the right, um, just to tease people into uh, thinking about clicking that link to subscribe to this. What are um, what are some of the, the recent articles that have been in there that might uh, capture some people's curiosity? Okay, in the last one, uh, you know, we did... Uh... We did a little bit of coverage, too, on the Eastern Snowmobile Hall of Fame that was sent to us by Mid, so I thank him for that, you know. And, uh, sure. We have uh, one thing we've never done before we did this time. We we kind of did a tribute to the women of, you know, vintage snowmobile racing in this article um, for 2021. And it was surprising yeah. when that thing started how many women we actually have racing, and I know we still miss quite a few and we're going to try to do better next year at that you know um you know olaf Ann, you know olaf Ann always writes this nice little tech article um in the last yeah. issue it was uh mccooney float bowl carbs which was it's a very sure. detailed and good issue you know um we always got the, the events calendar and we got the classifieds the want ads um the third annual uh Marinville, pennsylvania show was in there sent to us that was a nice that was a nice one. And, of course, the centerfold was uh, the big races at Eagle River, the world championship for the vintage yeah. stone building. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Cool deal. Yeah, and I encourage people to click on the link in the description to uh, go on by and check that out. It's, uh, it's a great magazine. If you, if you love vintage snowmobiling, it's, it's the magazine, the reference for this hobby. 
All right. And now, you know, before if anyone, we, yeah. ahead, I'm sorry. Maybe, oops, if anyone does have like a restoration they're doing or something like that too, and they want to take some pictures of their restoration on the steps as they go, you know, write us a little article like where they found the sled and the parts and stuff like that. Uh, we'd be more than happy to publish that too. So. Wonderful. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, people love reading about that stuff. And and that's the thing I'm finding with this podcast. People like viewing that on video and they enjoy it just as much in print. And um, yeah, it's it's just really interesting to, to view that, whether it's in print or on, on a screen. Yeah, for sure. Now, before we switch gears to talk about Central Minnesota Pond Racing, did you have any last comments on, on the magazine before we switch gears? Um, yeah, just one big thing for us coming up. You know, we started in 2006, the VSCA Vintage Snowmobile National Show. And this year it's going to be in Marshfield, Wisconsin. It looks like it's gaining a lot of traction right now. I mean, um, it's pretty centrally located from east to west. Um, we might miss some of the Canadians that we're hoping to have. If the border gets over now, we don't know yet. But, um Sure. And again, there's an ad in the last couple of magazines. It's online. Um, it's a great, it's going to be another big show. The vintage shows have been doing very well at the nationals. And uh, a year from now, we'll be back out East somewhere again. We're just waiting to oh, hear good. about that here real soon. And we'll be announcing that too. So. Good. Yeah. I hope to run into you there. I know that's where we met back in two, 2016 was at the Lancaster show. That's the show. Yeah. Great show there too. It was sure. a lot of fun. And, and I think I have a graphic of uh, some of the shows that you've been talking about. Yes, the graphic on the right, I think, is the show you were just talking about, right? Uh, yeah, the VSCA Nationals, yep. Sure. And then you sent me graphics for these other two shows. Did you have any thoughts on those while they're up on the screen? Or? No, yeah, you know, uh, coming up Memorial Weekend, you know, St. Germain, that's always a great show. You know, that one will be here. And then um, the 25th anniversary of the Millbank show, Millbank, South Dakota. Um, you buy a mug for a hundred bucks. It's you get a uh, free beer, root beer all weekend, free hog rolls, free camping, free swap meat. It's gonna. I think that's gonna be a really good fun time there too. Yeah, for sure. It sounds like with so much there, if they don't have it, you don't need it, right? That's right. It's pretty much everything's <laughs> gonna be nice. Very cool. Now, before we switch gears into the. Uh, uh, Central Minnesota Pond Racing. I do have a quick video. It's about a, I think about a two-minute video that shows one of the races in the F500 class. I'm going to run that real quick, and then and we'll chat about that on the other side if that's all right. All right, I'm going to roll it. Minnesota, he'll be on that uh, again. Woody's Traction Rocks Handguards Machine. Jordan Johnson's a good one. Of course, Jordan comes out of St. Cloud. He'll be out there again. The Shaper Racing Moon 21. Austin Kramer, the 965 on the Clear Lake. Jason Smoody, the 6. Jason, I think, is actually right here out of Detroit Lakes. Uh, up in this area up here anyway. Jason Smoody on that number 6. And then Jared Jost out of Alexandria, Minnesota, also comes out. Uh, he'll be out there. And Jost just jumped the gun. And he got to go to the back on that one there. Okay, let's try it again one more time. They drop the green. Here we go. Graber got a little bit of a hole shot in that one. Austin Graber on a clear lake on that 965. I tell you, the Graber boys have been fun to watch. Those two brothers go at it. He's been racing since he was 12 years old. He's about 25 now, I believe. As they come off turn four, look at this. Here they come. Look at this battle for the lead again. It's going to be Smoody in the lead. Johnson's up there now. Man, and they're switching all over the place. A lot of shuffling back and forth as they go back and forth down that back straightaway. The first five sleds all locked up, three-way battle for third right now. Here they come, Smoody's got the lead right now, coming off turn four, hanging good, looking good, the sixth machine out there. Now Sears comes up there in the 15, he joins the party, and they switch it around some more. Sears on the 15, moves to second, Smoot takes the lead down the back straightaway. Here comes Hunter Sears one more time on the outside. And keep an eye, it looks like Graber may be running third as they come off turn four. And it's going to be Smoney with a win. Sears second. And Jordan Johnson finishing third on the 21J. Yikes. How about that, everybody?
So there you have it. That was a look at Central Minnesota Pond Racing. Uh, yeah, can you tell us about that, Mike? Where where did that all get started, and and your involvement in it, and, and yeah, where we are today? Yeah, in 2013, actually, my daughter and I were sitting talking one night, and uh, what we were really missing in Minnesota here was a place for people to start racing. Um, we had some pretty high caliber stuff, you know, the you know Oval Racers Alliance, all that stuff, but the competition was very tough to get into, and it was quite expensive. So uh, we started what we called, actually we started out as Mid-Minnesota Winter Shoals, but we always raced on a lake and we kind of picked up the name Pond Racers. So we said, well, let's just call ourselves Central Minnesota Pond Racers or CMPR yeah. for sure. And, you know, in the last seven years, it, it's grown at a rate we never would have imagined. Uh, we're by, probably by far the largest circuit. I don't want to say across the whole snow belt, but definitely in the Midwest right now. Um, yeah, we sure. race everything from vintage single cylinders to pro lights all in the same day, you know, so. That's cool. And so something for everybody at every affordable. stage of racing. Yeah, and every stage that in between. Cool. We go all the way up through the Perfect. vintage super stocks, vintage mod leaf spring, you know, the IFS snow pro sleds, and we do junior, a lot of, we have like six junior classes all the way from um, junior vintage, we have a 10 and under class, 11 to 15 class. And then we got junior novice, junior one sprint, junior two sprint, junior 500. Um, I think we had about 26 juniors racing with us this year. 26. That's amazing. Yeah. That's yeah, cool. That, That's the future that, of this hobby, too. It was our goal for us. And the juniors all run free with us. They don't pay anything to oh, race. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Now, what we're talking here, I'm putting um, some comments on the screen, and they're coming in so hot and heavy that I lost my place. But uh, the bottom line is they're saying they're really enjoying this. Uh, where the heck? Here we go. Okay. But uh, but please continue your, your thought. I'm sorry. But, oh, the thing I was going to mention about the juniors, that that is the future of this hobby, and that's, that's really encouraging to see uh, so many juniors interested in this, you know, to show up to race like that. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, um, and we also let the moms get involved. I think we have about yeah. 18 women drivers too. We make classes for them. So dad can come and play, mom can play, and so can the kids. And some nice. of them, we have a, they can have one sled and they all three can race the same sled. You know, so it doesn't oh, have to be perfect, very expensive. Yeah. And we got a business, yeah, model, a business model where each driver pays $35 that day. And then they can sign up for as many classes as they have a legal sled for and run for that one $35 fee. Um, nice. No insurance fees, no membership fees. Um, my daughter and I go out and we just raise sponsorship to pay for all that and give the drivers a break, you know? That's amazing. That keeps it really affordable and accessible to pretty much anyone who wants to do it. Yeah, right. Very cool, very cool. And, um, yeah, I'm just popping some comments up on here. People are really liking this. And the thing I was going to mention, too, is that I hear a lot about Central Minnesota Pond Racing doing this podcast. A lot of people will say, you know, if there's racing this week or, you know, these kind of comments. And, and it's like, yeah, it's it's a household name, uh, not only, I think, in the Midwest, but just across the, the vintage snowmobile hobby. Uh, yeah, well, a couple of years ago, we started doing the live streams, you know, which is um, it's, it's not real cheap to do that, but we usually raise enough sponsorship to pay for that. And then everybody gets to live stream our races free. Um, we got some great sponsors and I should have had a list of them here tonight, but uh, I don't want to, if, if I start naming them off, I'm going to miss some important ones. I'm sure, you know, uh, I can totally say understand. like our country cat of Sox Center, Minnesota, the Wondershites, they're our title sponsor. I mean, those guys, you know, stick a lot of money in our little circuit and help us out a lot. You know, um, there's many other ones too, you know? Sure. That is very cool. And to people who are regular viewers on my Vintage Snowmobile Lovers Facebook page, I've I've carried some of those races, both live and after the fact, um, for people to see, with your permission, of course. And it's gotten very good uh, viewership, sometimes uh, seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 views. Uh, so it's, it's been very well received. Uh, yeah, we usually get, each race we have about between twenty one and 24,000 viewers during the race. Um, nice. From Sweden... One day we had like people logged in from Sweden, Canada, um, Arizona, Florida, Texas, 
So, I mean, that's the cool part. People that would never see racing, you know, get to, and get to watch racing for the day, you know. Yeah. Um, I know the ball breaks and stuff like that get a little boring, but that's just kind of part of the day, you know. Uh, sure. The racing was really good this year. And some of the racers show up from uh, many states away as well. I know Josh Gilbert uh, had been plan had planned to go this year, and he was going to come out from I think Idaho, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, and we were, yeah, um, Pierce Lake, Idaho, yes. I believe. Yeah, and yeah, I was, I yeah, I was right. looking forward to that, and uh, and actually they were going to bunk with me for a week or so here, so it was going to be a great time, and hopefully things work out better for them next year, and they can. They can make it out and come play with us. You know? so. Yeah, for sure. But that that's really is impressive that people from that far away um, are interested in coming to that event, you know, to participate. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, and we usually been... get, you know, Michigan and Wisconsin are pretty well re represented. Iowa, North South Dakota, uh, Logan, Utah. We had a guy show up from there this year and raced with us. We used to have quite a few Canadians again like this year. I usually have about 12, 15 Canadian drivers, but they couldn't make it across the border. You know, the border is still sure. closed. Border still locked up. Yeah. yeah, sure. Now, I've got a comment on the screen from our friend George Frappion. Um, he was wondering about how to subscribe to the magazine. And, George, there is a, a link in the description uh, for you to be able to subscribe. Also, uh, if you're interested in Central Minnesota Pond Racing, uh, there's links in the description for that as well. If you get on their Facebook page and start scrolling down, just keep scrolling. You'll see a number of uh, different races there, and you can watch the whole, pretty much the whole season uh, from the Facebook page. Right, and anybody that wants to subscribe the magazine too, you know, it's, uh, it's just www.vsca.com, and there's a store right there they can sign up. Um, when they get on the, there too, they can see my phone number. They can call me. Uh, nice. Yeah, in fact, I was on that page today. I think if, if the VSCA.com page, if you scroll down to the bottom of that page, there's a link for a subscription. Yeah, or right on top, you can go over to the store, hit store, then it'll say, you know, sign, you know, subscriptions too. Oh, good, the, the store, store link too. Excellent. Yep. Good deal. Good deal. Great. Well, cool. Um, any final thoughts, Mike, before we wrap things up? Or uh, No, I just, thanks a lot for letting me come on tonight and Hopefully you can do this again sometime. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank, Anything all viewers, thank all the viewers that, you know, come on and, and listen to us, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I thank you for coming on as well. And any, anytime you have something to uh, talk about, whether with, 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 whether it's with racing, the magazine or any kind of events, uh, please be in touch with me. We'd love to help have you on here and promote that. All right. Sounds great. All righty. Thanks, Mike. Have a good evening. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, that was a lot of fun having Mike on to discuss all the things he's involved with. Um, and we hope that he's a regular on the show here. Now, um, next up, we've got Ray Lacasse. Ray was on here last week uh, talking about a vintage snowmobile event that he was working on. And he's going to – let me get the right uh, – sorry. I'm <laughs> moving around on the interface here. Let's, uh, let's bring Ray on, and uh, he's going to tell us all about that event and get, get his microphone on. How you doing, Ray? Good, Mike. How are you? Good. It's great to see you. Good to um, see you, too. So I can't wait to hear about this event. Tell me how that went. Well, it, it went very, very, very well. For, for something that we just started to put together about four weeks ago or four weeks prior to the event, um, you know, we were expecting maybe at, at the beginning, if we got lucky, probably 75 to 100 sleds. And we had close to 200 vintage sleds for our first event. It was <laughs> tremendous. Amazing. Wonderful. Yes, it hear. was. It was very wonderful. And people were coming from several states away, weren't they, a lot of them? Uh, we had people coming from Connecticut, from New York, from Pennsylvania, from uh, Rhode Island, from Massachusetts, uh, Maine, Vermont. Um, it was incredible. The people that said that they got up and they left at 4 o'clock in the morning to get up here by 9 o'clock just to do this event. So it was, it was really, really cool to see that. That's amazing. That is dedication to the vintage hobby, isn't it? It is. It is. And, and, and the trails that we have up here are just unbelievable. People, um, your friend Midge Rosebrook, who uh, has been my friend for a long, long, long time, when he got off his sled for the first leg of it before the cookout, he was just shaking his head in awe that he could not believe 
how much fun and how big these trails were and how wide and, and flat and just beautiful condition and beautiful scenery. That's amazing. Yeah. Good deal. And then I have to inquire too for um, people that are interested in trying to find places where they can still do some late season trail riding. Are there opportunities in or near Pittsburgh where someone can try to do get a few miles in? There are some still left, Mike. Um, this year is kind of a, a bad year um, for most of the trails. Usually we can leave from anywhere in Pittsburgh this time of year. But right now it's the northernmost part of Pittsburgh, which if people don't know, Pittsburgh is the biggest township uh, east of the Mississippi. So we cover a lot of area. Um, we have 230 miles of trails just in Pittsburgh alone. So if they trail a further north in Pittsburgh up towards uh, East Inlet and in, um, Deer Mountain Campground, there's still some riding. I saw some posts today on Facebook where people put about 60 miles on, had a great day. Wonderful. So for those late season trail riders that are watching this, you heard it here on the Vintage Snowmobile podcast. There's still some places where you can grab that last, uh, last ride of the season. Yeah, and we're supposed to get a little bit more snow Monday, and it's going to be cool next week, so who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> sure, it could go on for another couple of weeks if we're lucky. You never know. Good deal. Now, you sent me some photos from this event, and I put yep. them together into a little montage with some music. Uh, let's take a quick look at that. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Sure. So I'm hoping that that little montage is going to tease people into thinking about coming up there next year for this ride. Yeah, it, you know, it's it's incredible the amount of people I talked to and the stories that were told. Um, but there's so many people that said they had a lot of friends that want to do this. They had obligations because this came up so quick. Um, they're looking forward to bringing a lot of people with them next year. Um, I've got people messaging me still uh, to, to this minute probably. <laughs> from this event, which is, which is incredible. And it's a testament to uh, not just the trails in Pittsburgh, but the people that are dedicated uh, to the vintage sport. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And, and the stories are just fantastic. Um, we're looking at um, probably having somewhere guessing with the people that have responded somewhere between 350 and 400 sleds next year. That's amazing. It's going to be amazing. great. Oh, and I meant to ask you, um, what would you say the ratio was of vintage snowmobiles to modern snowmobiles that showed up at that? Oh, I would say there's probably 90% vintage snowmobiles. The 10% that showed up may have been a couple of people that were riding with them that didn't have a vintage sled. Uh, a lot of them just happened to be riding the trails and, and, and saw all these vintage sleds and just stopped in awe walking around and just just having a good time. I mean... It, it, it was it, it was about the vintage sleds, but it was about the snowmobile family. It, it, it was just awesome. A real strong sense of community. Yes, it was. Nice. Now, I have to ask you this, too. If there's someone who's thinking about doing this next year, and they're maybe either going to fly in or drive from a long distance, and they may not want to trail their sleds up, are there rental opportunities for someone like that? There are. We, we have a great place here in Pittsburgh. It's uh, Bear Rock Adventures. Um, they helped sponsor this event with us. They, they were very gracious uh, when I went to them. Um, they have brand new snowmobiles. Uh, they have a pretty good fleet of snowmobiles uh, because we have a lot of people that come up every weekend. So, yes, 
there's absolutely uh, a place for them to get a snowmobile to rent to do this. Wonderful. That is good to hear. And and tell us, what is the date of this? What, when and where and all of that, if there's someone's thinking about this for next year? Yeah, well, we, we've picked the date already. It's going to be the same weekend. It's going to be March 19th of 2022. Um, we're expecting, like I said, 350 to 400 sleds. So we're probably going to have, uh, and we're going to work on this. It's going to be a, a work in progress, but it looks like we'll probably have like three starting points that would go a couple of miles before they merge onto the same trail. Um, yeah. So we're going to have plenty of parking, plenty of uh, uh, trails to ride. And if they're registered, like I said, we got 230 miles. If they want to go ride, they can go ride and have some fun. That's amazing. And if I remember correctly, for those who have maybe a vintage sled that's not registered, if they just stayed on the trail that you were going on, that, that circuit, that loop, they didn't have to register their sled. Do I understand that correctly? You do understand that correctly. Uh, we're permitted through the state. Um, we will get another permit for next year. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't even have to be a vintage sled. They could bring up a new sled. They can run any sled that they want as long as they stay on the marked trail during the designated time uh, without it being registered. That's an amazing opportunity. Yep. That is cool. Well, I'm going to tease the people just a little bit more because I not only do we have that photo montage we just looked at, I've also got some footage that you sent me. Um, Great. Let's uh, take a look at that, and I'll catch up with you on the other side of it. Awesome. I want to relive this again. Absolutely. <laughs> That looks like so much fun. It was a ball. As you can see, the trails are beautiful, too. It, it was a beautiful day. 99.9% .9 of the trails had snow on it. We had just very, very few spots in a corner here and there that might have been a little bare, but the rest of it was beautiful. That's amazing. And there were, as watching the, all of these sleds go by, that reminds me, of the and looking at the images too, the still images reminds me of the ride ins of yesterday year that we all used to go to back in the day. And I think that was kind of your goal with this, wasn't it? Didn't you have a cookout in the middle of it too? We did. We had a cookout. Everything was free to anybody that wanted, uh, even people that came by on on a regular sled. Um, it was all free. We had a cookout about probably it was a, it was a thirty mile loop and uh, probably about eighteen miles into it, we had a cookout. We had a beautiful area where people could park and enjoy. Um, it, it was a great time. The, the stories were just priceless. Um, talking about the days of, you know, when they used to ride these sleds, their parents had these sleds, they bought these sleds because of that. Um, and, and, and the stories, it's what it was about. It, it, it was phenomenal. That's amazing. And you're right. It was about the community back in the day. It wasn't a, like you said earlier too. It's not about how many miles you put on. It's about the fun that you're having with your friends and the activities and and uh, we used to stop sometimes to make a fire on the side of the trail, cook hot dogs, or we'd all go to a restaurant, or you just get a whole bunch of friends. And you'd see friends when you're out on the trail, and they'd join you, and you'd get this big convoy going, this big posse going. And, and it, it sounds like it was kind of reliving that. And 
uh, it just sounds like a whole lot of fun. Was that was that was your goal with it too, wasn't it? To kind of try to relive that that magic of yesteryear. It, it absolutely was. I mean, in 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 one of the gentlemen that I talked to, I don't remember his name, but he hit it so perfect. You know, he said this back in the '60s and '70s. It used to be a social event. They'd take the families and go out and do a 20 mile ride, and they'd stop and start a fire and have a cookout, and they would talk and throw snowballs and just. Just have a good. It was a social event for the family, and 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 he said this is a social event. Everybody's talking, um, and and this is what it's about. It's not about doing 150 miles in one day. It's not to see who can go the fastest. It was just an event for you, you know for everybody to get together and talk and enjoy yesteryear. Wonderful, a chance to make new friends and have good times with old friends, and yeah, absolutely, that's, absolutely, that's amazing. That's amazing. Now, when we spoke earlier, I think you mentioned uh, for next year, you're, you're thinking about structuring it a little bit differently and maybe incorporating a swap meet as part of that. Yeah, we're looking, a couple I'm of not details sure if that'll that? happen next year, the swap meet. Uh, it might be the year after, but um, sure. we're, we're going to try hard to do it, uh, to, to make it a weekend event and have a swap meet. Um, many of the people that I talked to, that I went around and talked to, uh, they were all for it. They were really excited that I brought that subject up. Uh, because somebody's always looking for something, something that somebody else might have. Yeah, and somebody's always looking to part with something too, for a part to a sled they don't have anymore, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a great opportunity for sure. Yes, yeah, and Good we're going to do some other fun things too next year that we didn't think of until after this year. Like, who drove the who drove the furthest away? Uh, who's got the oldest sled? You know, we're going to put up some prize money for stuff like this and, 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 and do some other fun things uh, that we're going to work on this summer to uh, enhance this a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Those kinds of things make it so much more fun. Yep. Definitely. That is cool. Very cool. Uh, any final thoughts, Ray, before we wrap it up? Or? Uh, no. I, I Thank you, Mike, for having us on. And, and thank you for all the people that are watching. Um, this is going to be a big event next year. And, and if you've never been to Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, um, the trails are second to none. Our, our, our Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Ridge Run and Snowmobile Club, um, they work tirelessly to make these trails flat. Um, they do everything they can to make it such a great experience up here. Lodging up here is phenomenal. Um, just a great area, great scenery, a uh, lot of things for people to do on the trails. Wonderful. And as it gets closer to the event uh, next winter, we'll have to have you come on and we'll do some promotion on it and and to make some noise for it so we can get uh, that many more people to show up. I love that. I appreciate that, Mike. Thank you very much. My pleasure. You know what we're going to try to do? We're going to try to make it like Woodstock. You remember the footage of Woodstock in 69 where the yeah. highways were closed? Yeah. <laughs> we're going to make it. We're going to have uh, history repeat itself. <laughs> that would be awesome. That would be yeah, awesome. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cool deal. All right. Well, thank you, Ray. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for having me. My pleasure. Have a good one. You too. Cool. Uh, let me just get this suggested here. There we go. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Great having the, both uh, Ray and Mike on. Uh, just had some really great things to talk about and show us. Uh, let's see what is next on the agenda here. We've got some announcements, and I do have a couple to make here. I was in touch with Holly McDermott earlier today. Now, she is looking for uh, for a friend of hers. Uh, wondering about uh, Arctic Hat racing sleds. Uh, wondering if there's any twin track racing sleds or racing sleds uh, from the 70s and 80s, uh, something like what you're looking at here, uh, or anything like that. If if you have anything like that, or if you know of a sled like that that is for sale, uh, leave a comment in the description, and she will be looking for that. Um, and I'm going to ask Holly, if you're watching, Holly, uh, keep checking on this every few days because this uh, the algorithm serves this video up to people on Facebook and YouTube over the next few days, and people will be making comments over the next few days. So do check in uh, two or three times over the next week, and uh, maybe there'll be an answer there for you. Uh, what else have we got for announcements? We have a couple of sleds for sale. I know I've showed these, but I'll show them one more time. Uh, my good friend Paul Crane out in Lancaster, New Hampshire, has some sleds for sale. These are sleds that were once on display in Crane's Snowmobile Museum. There's an Arctic Cat Panther here. That looks like maybe a 70 or a 71 to me. If you're curious about that sled, give Paul a call, 603-443-7272. Uh, 
Also, another sled for sale by Paul. This was once in Crane's Snowmobile Museum as well. This is er an early rear-engine Polaris. If you're curious about this, give Paul a call at 603-443-7272. Now, also in the announcement section, let me cue this up. Uh, my new friend, George Papillon. Now, George Papillon is up in the Montreal area, and he's a regular viewer of the show. And he and I have been emailing, and we spoke on the phone today. He had some images that he sent me from back when he used to race uh, back in the 70s and 80s. And I put them into a little montage with some music behind it. Uh, let's take a look at that right now. So, yes, thank you very much to George Papillon for sharing those images. Uh, and I, we had a great conversation today, George and I, and we had some great ideas for some future video projects. He's He's got some uh, contacts that have vintage sleds, and he's talking about maybe approaching them uh, to do some video that we would uh, share on this podcast at a future date. So thank you so much for that idea, George. Very much looking forward to uh, collaborating with you on that. So let's go back to the um, the, uh, the schedule here, the, the man of... <laughs> Lots for words for the agenda for the evening agenda is the word I was looking for now the next item is actually not on the um, on this agenda but I'm going to play it anyway the reason for that is because uh, I made this video late in the day after I'd made that uh, that graphic but our good friend and regular viewer George uh, John Springer jr. has made a video and I'm going to play it right now let's uh, let's get this up on the screen How did, uh, I'm not used to doing it this way let me try it uh, Hi, I'm John Springer Jr. and I started snowmobiling in 1965. That was our first snowmobile we had was a Skidoo 10 horse. And then in 1966, we bought a second sled and that was Olympic S. And that also was a 250cc uh, sled. And that was the first sled that I raced. <clears throat> and I worked on the engine. Being in stock A, you can't do a whole lot of things to the sleds. And I set the timing as far ahead as I possibly could without burning a hole in the piston. And then I worked the carburetor to give it more fuel and air. And that was about basically all you could get away with back in stock A in 1966. I have my racing bib on that is 55 years old. And uh, USSA, uh, that was the first bib I got when I raced my first race. And then we uh, had, I got to tell you a little story, uh, the 250, uh, after having a timing so far ahead like that, when you'd start it, it would backfire once in a while. And then every time when you shut it off, it would backfire like a gun going off. So one day I went out in the garage to start the snowmobile up and I give it gas and I backed into the lawn tractor. So being a young knucklehead like I was, I grabbed the skis, I pulled it away from the lawn tractor, got back on the snowmobile, give it gas again, and it backed into the lawn tractor again. So then I shut the engine off and I pulled the snowmobile away from the lawn tractor and I started the engine back up again. And this time I'm looking back and I give it gas and the snowmobile went forward. So I guess I invented the first uh, Skidoo snowmobile at reverse. But anyway, I'm not going to talk about my racing career this time. I got a couple sleds that I've worked on this last summer that are restored from bumper to bumper. And uh, I'm going to show you them. Uh, I got to switch the screen here. Okay, this is a 1996 Skidoo MXZ. And uh, this is the same type of sled that Tony Heikaden back in 1996 raced snowcross with. He won the USA and Canadian championships on it. And it's got 10 inches of travel in the rear. It's got the ES, ETS SC10 rear suspension, and it's got the DSA front independent 10 inch travel suspension. The skis from outside to outside measure 46 inches. This is on a S2000 chassis. Skidoo built this chassis especially for snowcross racing. It's a very, very strong, rigid chassis to take all the jumps and big bumps and everything. And uh, it uh, was a really good handling sled. I uh, 
was looking for one for quite a while and I found this one and I restored it. I'm gonna open the hood up. Okay, I uh, started from the rear bumper. I put a new track on it, new high fax slides, all new bearings on the idler wheels, all new bearings on the drive axle and the jack shaft bearings. I rebuilt the clutches on it and uh, I pulled the motor out and freshened the motor up. It's got a 583 rotary valve engine and that rotary valve was designed back in 1975 on a 245 RV and it feeds the gas and oil directly into the crankcase. It's not a piston port, it's a rotary valve. When the valve opening comes around it sucks the air and fuel into the crankcase and then as the valve closes the gas and fuel is trapped in the crankcase so there's no blowback or blow by or spit of fuel coming out. Everything that goes in the crankcase is in the crankcase. So that was a pretty good design by uh, changing the duration on that rotary valve you could make these engines have some tremendous out of the hole low end. And then also this engine has the power rave valves. And uh, those actually were back in 1978, they came out on the Skidoo's uh, Can-Am dirt bikes. They were the first ones, first Rotex engines that have that power rave engine valves. And then in 1985, Skidoo put it on the 340 twin track engine. And when the twin trackers came down from Canada, the Eagle River, they pretty much dominated the world championship race. Michel Gingras, he was almost a, a lap ahead of everybody. The Power Rave uh, valves, they just give us tremendous horsepower on top end. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. And this is some of the unique design and engineering that they did in the mid-90s. Mid and uh, being a, 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 a guy that uh, likes uh, speed and that, uh, I wanted to build some muscle sleds from the 90s that had some good horsepower and, and things you could do with them to make them fast. So this was fun building the engine up. I, uh, I worked a little of my magic on it. And uh, after I got done with it, it pulled over really, really hard. So I had to, I don't know if you can see this or not. They make actually a larger rewind that you can put on these sleds. So you can pull them over. Otherwise it takes two guys to pull them over. But uh, it develops 115 horse. And uh, I took it out on, we have a, a, a railroad track right away that's the four lane. And I took it out on the railroad right away. And it's just under a mile. And I put my GPS on the handlebars and I ran it and the thing pulls really, really hard. Super horsepower, super out of the hole. And it went up to 112 miles an hour. And uh, the GPS showed 112 and my speedometer on the snowmobile showed 115. So it's pretty close. But it's a fun sled to drive, great horsepower. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to restore one of these because of the technology they had in the mid 90s uh, was really advanced over the 70s and 80s. But uh, a great sled, it, it was fun to read. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I apologize I couldn't get anybody to help me and it's uh, kind of hard to, to start snowmobiles and open hoods when you're holding onto a camera. But uh, I enjoy the podcast. Mike does a heck of a job. And uh, everybody uh, keeps putting some input into it. Uh, it'll be pretty awesome. So till next time, have fun and keep her on the trail. Bye. Sorry, folks, I had my mic off. Yeah, that was a video from John Spranger Jr., and I thank John so much for sending that video. I really appreciate it. And that, uh, I wanted to make a comment. That's the spirit of what I'd like this podcast to be. It's all well and good that I put my videos on here and everything, but I really would like this to be a reflection of the vintage snowmobile community where people are sending me videos and images and things that I can share on here so as vintage enthusiasts we can all see what each other is doing. Uh, it's a, just a great uh, reflection of the hobby. It's kind of a way to, if you will, hold a mirror up to the hobby, the vintage snowmobile hobby, and a way for us to all see what uh, the other is doing. Uh, so what is next on the agenda? We have uh, number four, item number four, George Gordon inducted into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame uh, in 2020. This was just this past fall. Let me cue up that video, and let's take a look at that. Okay. Let's start with our first inductee.
Mr. George Wood. George, you can go. Oh, George, why don't you just sit there for a minute? I'm going to read your little plaque, and then I'll have you come up. George earned the fourth lowest bid number for stock classes during his first year of competition, becoming season high point winner in B stock and second high point winner in A stock. He dominated every class he entered at the 1974 New England Snowmobile Open in Greenville, Maine, winning all four places in A stock, B stock, and C stock. George won first place in B stock at the 1974 World Series in Eagle River, Wisconsin. During the second race in 1974, George was injured, injured in a crash, ending his bid for the 74-75 season. In his first, very first race back in 1975, he won three firsts and a second at Jackman, Maine, the very first race of the season. For the next three years straight, George enjoyed a perfect attendance record by never missing a single race. George had garnered over 75 trophies in just the first three years of racing, attaining the number two gold big. His impeccable gentleman-like conduct, both on and off the track, earned George Gordon New England Sportsman of the Year Award for 1978. He grabbed three firsts, three seconds, and a third at the inaugural Grand Granite State Open Championships in Berlin, New Hampshire in 1979. George worked tirelessly to improve racing, both as a member of the USSA New England Board of Directors and as chairman of the Safety Committee. Mr. George Gordon, please come take your flag. Start off by saying I want to thank Mitch. Mitch, is this working? Yep, yep, there we go. Mitch, Paul, Rick, Bruce, the directors of the Hall of Fame, for allowing me to be inducted into the New England Snowmobile Hall of Fame. I'm humbled to be on the wall with all the great races that I've looked up to when I first started. I want to thank Rick and Eric Sibyl. As their father, George, who was who was the one that got me started racing in USA. At the time, I was racing local races in Tipple Pass area, and after one of the races, we were at a snowmobile club having a drink. That's a surprise. <laughs> and Rick's father, George, said, I think you should be racing in USSA. And if you want to, I own an out cap dealership, and I will sell you a race car, race sled, and all the parts you need at my cost. He kept his word. I bought a race sled that I raced in A and B stock. My son also... Why don't you hold that for a minute? Okay, where the hell was it? <laughs> I race in the USSA. If you want to, I own a dealership and I will sell you a race sled, sled and all the parts you need at my cost. And he kept his word. I bought a sled that I raced in A and B stock and my son also raced in Junior 1 and 2 and he did very well winning 1 and 2 all along the way. I'm sorry to say Mr. Simmel has passed away at a very young age. I raced snowmobiles every weekend for over 10 years. I want to tell you the best help I had was my son and John Finity. He went with me every weekend and he also went to want to thank my family for putting up with me being away every weekend. I met a lot of great people along the way, some of which I still are friends with today. Just to say a few, Eric and Rick Similar, Bruce, Orbach, the Roystons, the Santasis, John Hooper, Ann Fanoni, Marvin and Helen Rock, J.R. Toja, John Merriman, uh, Landy Benoit, Del Garcia, Peter Olanik, Davy Avery, and his father, the legend, the Holmes family, the Yusko family, and so many more. I want to give a special thanks to Samantha for watching my kids when I first started racing. Thank you, Sam. The snowmobile has been a great part of my life for 45 years. I am honored to be in the Hall of Fame. Thanks again, Mitch, Paul, Rick, Bruce, and the Board of Directors. Awesome, George. Rick, can you come up here, please, so we have a picture? I can have your wife come up. My name is George Gordon, and I'm very happy to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, Snowmobile Hall of Fame up here in Lancaster. I raced snowmobiles for probably 12 years, 13 years, maybe 12 of them, are, 8 of them, are, I raced every race, for, I never missed a race for at least 8 years in a row. And then uh, I, I left it one time probably and was out for 2 years, and then I came back and raced again for another 2 years, and I was very happy, I was very, uh, I thought I was successful at it, and uh, I was pretty honored to be able to get into the Hall of Fame. A lot of people worked hard for me to get in there, yeah. Bruce and, and Mitch. And, and uh, Paul yeah. and all the uh, board of directors for the Hall of Fame, and uh, I really feel humbled to be with these same people that when I first started riding snowmobiles and racing snowmobiles, I looked up to, and, and, and I just I never thought I would be able to be in su such a position to be on the Hall of Fame. Yeah, and I really do appreciate it. Thank Wonderful. you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. So there you have it, George Gordon inducted into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame this past fall, September 2020. Uh, and this, this Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame just grows bigger and bigger 
and more interesting and more popular every year. And I would like to cordially invite you to join us for the next one. Let me put up a graphic and I'll tell you all about it. Uh, the next one, why is, there we go, uh, is going to be Saturday, September 11th, 2021. Now it says 1 p.m. Eastern on the, uh, uh, Eastern time there. It actually starts at 1.30, but I like to have 1 p.m. on there and I'll tell you why. Um, you want to get there early for a couple of reasons. Number one, you want to bring lawn chairs. It's a, it gives you, getting there early allows you to stake out a spot for your lawn chairs. And once you've done that, you're, you're going to want some time to go into Crane's Snowmobile Museum because this, uh, this the induction ceremony takes place in the parking lot at Crane's Snowmobile Museum. So while you're there, you, of course, want to go into the museum. It is a 50 by 100 foot building with over 100 vintage snowmobiles in there, racing snowmobiles, antique snowmobiles, you name it, it's probably in there. Uh, so you want to allow some time to go in there and walk around the museum and, and experience that. It's a wonderful thing. And then, of course, uh, before, after, and during the ceremony, there are inductees, past, present, and future there just hanging out, talking to each other and visiting, and it's an opportunity for you to mix and mingle with them, get your photo taken, uh, and just meet them and, and listen to amazing conversations as they visit with each other and tell these amazing stories about their experiences racing uh, back in the day. It's just an incredible, incredible experience. Now, once the ceremony is over, once the induction ceremony is over, everyone moves over to the Lancaster Motel, which is just a short walk away, where they have the after party. Uh, and the after party is a wonderful time, too. Everyone is celebrating and having a good time and visiting, and it's just a real lot of fun. And uh, if you're planning to attend this event from any distance away, uh, you want to book your room at the Lancaster Motel because if you're attending this after party, uh, once the after party winds down, you're just a few short steps from your room. And this, uh, the motel, the Lancaster Motel, is also a short walk from the induction ceremony at Grain Snowmobile Museum right there at the center of everything. Uh, I do have to tell you, though, if you're thinking about attending this ceremony and if you're thinking about staying at the Lancaster Motel to do it, call the Lancaster Motel right now to book your room because this event books the motel solid every year. So if you're thinking about doing this, call now to reserve your room. Um, and I thank you in advance for thinking about uh, joining us at this event. So what else do we have here? We have some footage uh, from Greg Dauberke out in Minnesota. I'm not Minnesota, Wisconsin. He uh, sent some footage to me a few years ago. Uh, at the This footage is from the 2017 Sockville, Wisconsin uh, Vintage Snowmobile Show. So let's take a look at his footage.
Yes, so thank you very much to Greg Dauberke for that really nice footage from the Salkville, Wisconsin Vintage Snowmobile Show back in 2017. Now, those those twin track mantas that were in that video, uh, those are Greg's. Greg is the man when it comes to trin, twin track snow, uh, yeah, twin track snowmobiles. Now, if you'd like to learn more about that, go to twintrackworld.com. That is his website where he celebrates twin track snowmobiles. Um, also, I've been talking, uh, uh, Greg and I have been emailing back and forth about having him come on the podcast sometime for some show and tell. He's, he has some twin track, uh, he has a twin track snowmobile collection, and we would love to have an up close and personal view of that uh, sometime on this podcast in the near future. So what do we have next? Our last video of the night is some, some old home movies of vintage ski doos supplied to us a few years ago by Mark Kirshner. Now, when it comes to footage of uh, snowmobiles, it's nice to see uh, footage at these modern events and so forth where we're celebrating these vintage snowmobiles. But to me, there's no substitute for actual footage that was taken back in the day, old home movies. And that's what we're going to look at right now. Let's, let's uh, roll that beautiful bean footage. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about you, but I just love looking at those old home movies of uh, snowmobiles from back in the day. It's just the way I remember it. Is it the way you remember it? Uh, watching them take those jumps with the skis flipping up and everything. Oh, God. Uh, there's just no substitute for 
for those days. It's just unbelievable. Uh, that reminds me of my very first ride on a snowmobile. It was on a an old ski do, probably an Olympic, maybe a '68 or '69, very much like the ones you saw in that footage. Um, I think it was uh, the winter of '70 '71. I think it was. I was six years old, and my father, I think, was thinking about maybe getting a snowmobile. So he put us all in the car, and we drove to one of these road in uh, road ends, one of these ride ends. Uh, where they had snowmobiles and things and um, people were riding the snowmobiles and they had a line there of, of some kids waiting to go on a snowmobile ride and of course i got in that line waiting to get on on a snowmobile for a ride my first ride ever on a snowmobile and when it was my turn i got on the back of there and they had those uh, metal hand grips on the on the back of there and went for a ride and it was a single width bombed out trail and the, there was a teenager that was driving it and he was going as fast as he could just bang 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 down the trail, knocking my teeth loose. Uh, but I loved it. I was holding on for dear life and getting, you know, banged around on that sled. But uh, I really enjoyed it. And we got back, and, of course, there was the line there. Other kids were waiting to go on. And um, when all of the kids had gone for their ride, um, he came back and said, hey, any anyone else want to go for a second time? And pick me, pick me. So, yeah, I was, had a chance for a second ride. Same thing, just bang, bang, bang down the trail, holding on for dear life. But... I loved it, and that's what started the whole thing for me anyway. Uh, you probably have a similar story as well if you were around during that era, uh, either as the driver of a sled like that for little kids or someone like me as a little kid on the back of that sled for their first experience. Uh, just amazing, amazing times. Well, that is all we have for this evening. I appreciate you guys coming on. This is the final episode of the season, uh, but I'm not going to leave you hanging. In this time slot uh, through the summer months, I'm going to continue to run uh, reruns of this podcast all through the summer months. So there'll be something in this time slot all through the summer months. And then in October, I'll pick up again with brand new live editions of the podcast. And I've got some cool ideas to make it bigger, better, more fun, and more interesting uh, for the next season. Now, I'm not going to be a stranger. Uh, from time to time, I will pop up either in that time slot or just randomly on the Vintage Snowmobile Lovers Facebook page uh, with something live. I've got some trivia night ideas and uh, some audience engagement things, and, and I've got some people I'm talking about, talking to about uh, doing some live video, so I may just come on some random night or afternoon or morning uh, with 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 uh, somebody live to do some show and tell or talk up some sleds or an event. Uh, I'll just surprise you. Um, so do keep an eye on this, this Vintage Snowmobile Lovers Facebook page because I'm not going to be a stranger, and uh, also keep an eye on this time slot every Thursday night, 9 p.m., there will be something on this time slot every week um, through the summer months, and it's going to be bigger and better and more fun on the other side in October. So with that, I thank you guys so much for being a part of this and making this first season of the podcast such an amazing experience. Um, could not have done it without you. Like I said, it's, it's one thing to do something like this. It's another thing for people to show up for it, and yet another thing still for people to show up every single week. And for you guys that do that, I thank you so much. I love you. And uh, that just makes this so much fun, I believe, for all of us. And like I said earlier, my goal with this is not just to show my own content, but to hold a mirror up to the vintage snowmobile hobby. And that's starting to take place. People are starting to send me images and videos, and people are contacting me about either coming on live or they know someone who they think should come on live. And uh, it's just a wonderful thing. We've got a few last comments on Mike Mayhar saying thanks for having him on tonight. That was a wonderful time with Mike, by the way. And uh, George Papillon uh, said another great show tonight and thanks me for sharing his old photos. And that's just a prime example of that. George shared me his old photos from yesteryear and I uh, put them together into a montage with a little music bed. And it's a way for all of us to enjoy vintage snowmobiling and see um, these, these were images from yesteryear, which are always a lot of fun. And it's also fun to see images of, of things people are doing today. Um, so just a good mix of the old and the new and just this podcast, my hope with this is to hold a mirror up to the vintage snowmobile hobby so we can all see what the hob what's going on with the hobby, what all each of us is doing. Um, so keep that in mind over the summer months. If you have images, if you have video, uh, if you know someone you think I should be talking to, don't be shy about sending an email. And if you're taking footage at events or if you want to do a walk around video of your sled, <coughs> pardon me, I'm losing my voice. Uh, do it with your cell phone, but be sure to hold your cell phone horizontally like this for a wide shot, not vertically like this, because it is very difficult to edit vertical footage. I know it's more comfortable to hold it in your hand to do video like this, but it's really difficult to uh, to edit. 
So if you're doing any kind of video for the podcast, please, I beg of you, hold the camera or the cell phone like this. All right, this time I'm really going to wrap it up. Thanks, guys, for a wonderful season. You guys are the best for coming here every week. It uh, really means a lot, and we've got bigger and better on the other side. Have a wonderful summer. And I'm not in the right place here on my interface. Now for this word from Mad Ramps. Now, if you decide that you like these Mad Ramps I'm about to show you, if you click the link in the description and order them through me, I will send you three free vintage snowmobile DVDs. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful summer. We'll catch you on the other side. It's the ultimate combination of simplicity and ingenuity. The newest way to load unload and transport your ATV or UTV the mad ramps pivoting ramp system made in the USA and engineered for strength and durability maneuver through tight places and over rugged terrain with plenty of ground clearance no licensing no ongoing maintenance costs and no storage hassles like trailers won't slip or move like conventional ramps. Free up more cargo space in the bed of your truck. Securely connects to your truck's receiver hitch. Easily extends for safe loading and unloading. Seamlessly retracts for highway and off-road travel. DOT approved in all 50 states and Canada. Quickly disconnects in under a minute. A unique space-saving storage system the Mad Ramps Pivoting Ramp System. Go farther. Go faster. Go safer. When you order using the link in the description, I'll send you three free vintage snowmobile DVDs. When you order using the link in the description, I'll send you three free vintage snowmobile DVDs.